I'm pleased to uh, greet you today and to introduce our guest, who is an old colleague of mine and a dear friend. He is currently the uh, Vice President for External Affairs of the Inter-American Foundation, a small and innovative foreign assistance organization of the United States government. Pat lives in Washington, D.C., and he's one of those I can say understands and loves the city and knows how it works. But what has been most intriguing to me, along with his scholarship, a political scientist trained at UCLA, um, Pat is above that, I think, in his heart, a, um, a curious investigator. He is, his talent is writing, and his talent is photography. He's published in numerous places with uh, high recognition, both um, articles and and photo essays that um, are notable. I have enjoyed my association with him. I am pleased that he would accept our invitation to be here today. And so please join me in giving welcome to Patrick Breslin. Good afternoon. I'm worried about both living up to the hopes expressed in the prayer and also to Sam's introduction. My first field work with the Inter-American Foundation, I had, I had done a lot of freelance work with the foundation as an independent writer, uh, visiting projects, writing articles, photographing. But when I joined the staff, um, after a few years on the staff in the publications office, I, did, I had my first assignment as a foundation representative in Honduras, and I, I followed Jan. <coughs> he had been the rep uh, in Honduras for several years before that, and we traveled a lot together. So most of what I learned about the, the foundation in the field and about working with the uh, community groups and NGOs in Latin America that we were trying to support came from that first experience with, with Jan. Uh, the other thing I learned from Jan at that point was the foundation is a very small agency, um, but any government agency has more bureaucracy than it needs. And I think one of the first things I learned from Jan was how to quickly cut through that bureaucracy. And I appreciate that. Um, the title that I chose today, and I, I was remembering when I was asked to give a title, I think I was uh, quite harried and frustrated in Washington, and I came up with this title. If, develop, if we know what works in development, why, do we, why don't we do more of it? And there's some obvious frustration um, implied in that title, uh, and personal frustration, because Part of my job in the external affairs office is I handle liaison with Congress. So part of what I try to do is convince people in Congress that more U.S. government foreign aid resources should go into this uh, kind of approach. Um, in my opinion, not enough does, and um, uh, that's partly uh, what I want to talk about today, trying, in a sense, trying to understand why that is. There's also a big assumption in that uh, title, <coughs> which is that we do know what works in, in foreign assistance. So let me start off by telling you briefly about the Inter-American Foundation, and, and perhaps more importantly than that, about the approach that it takes to development work. The foundation was created by the U.S. Congress, by, uh, really came out of the International Relations Committee, uh, subcommittee, uh, full committee of the House of Representatives in 1969, and it came as a reaction to uh, the first eight or nine years of the Alliance of Progress, which was the major foreign assistance program of the United States government for Latin America, kicked off during the, the uh, Kennedy presidency. Uh, in 68 and 69, the uh, International Relations Affairs um, Committee studied the alliance, had a series of hearings on it, and basically came to the conclusion that the alliance had been very effective in building uh, infrastructure in Latin America, but had not done that good a job on getting in getting U.S. assistance directly to poor people. So they wanted an alternative, and what came out in legislation that was finally passed at the end of 1969 was the creation of the Inter-American Foundation. They, they set up something that was intentionally meant to be innovative and, and a little bit uh, out of the pattern of government agencies. We, first of all, we're what's called a semi-independent government agency. We get our funding from the Congress, but we do not we're not part of any government department. We're not part of the State Department. We have a board. We're run by a board of directors, currently nine members. Uh, three of them come from the government, and it's uh, traditionally been the Assist Sec Assistant Secretary of State for Latin American Affairs in the State Department, the Assistant Administrator for Latin America in the 
in USAID, the uh, major U.S. Foreign Assistance Agency, and then one other government uh, figure who usually is somebody from either the Treasury Department, uh, the Organization of American States Ambassador, um, the representative to the Inter-American uh, Inter Development Bank, um, people like that. That's usually been a floating uh, position. And then the other six members come from the private sector, and they're, they're chosen so that the board is generally bipartisan. Uh, with a Republican administration in the Congress, uh, in, in the White House, we would have three members from the administration and two other Republicans, and then we would have four Democrats. That's when we have a full board. We currently don't, but that's the plan is that it would be as close to being bipartisan as possible. But probably the most the most important single thing about the foundation uh, is the approach that the early leadership elected to take, and that approach was to. Uh, basically be responsive to proposals that came to the foundation from grassroots groups and organizations all over Latin America, not from governments. Unlike most foreign assistance, we do not work through foreign governments. Uh, we notify embassies when we make uh, uh, grants to a group within their country, but that's about as far as it goes. The, um, the key thing is this idea that people in Latin America and the Caribbean, poor people, know what their problems are, have the capacity to organize themselves to do something about it, have the capacity to analyze their problems and come up with solutions. They present those, we invite their solutions, we invite their proposals. Uh, we are currently getting something like 1,200 a year from all over Latin America. We, we have the resources to fund about 60 new projects a year. So it's, it's an extremely tough competition. Uh, the, the proposals coming in, I think, are one of the greatest resources we have in terms of, in, in a sense, we're really, I think, hearing the voices of people who are dealing day-to-day -day with poverty in Latin America, presenting us their analysis and their, uh, their solutions. And uh, it's one of the greatest resources we have. I think it, it tends to keep us ahead of the curve in terms of what's going on on the ground in Latin America. Um, it also puts us in, in touch with some of the most remarkable people in the, in the region. But as a responsive agency, we only give money. We, we, we invite proposals, we analyze the proposals, we try to pick the ones that we think are the most innovative, the most interesting, and have the best chance of su success. We do not do any design of projects. We do a lot of interaction with the people. Uh, w once we sift through those 1,000, 1,200 proposals, get it down to a manageable number, then our field reps go to the countries and visit the groups. We, we never make a grant without having actually been in the community, talk to the people who are proposing it. Um, and we try to maintain as much contact as we can during the life of a project, but we don't have overseas staff, we don't manage projects. It's, it's their idea, it's their project. But we do ask for a lot of information, we try to keep in touch with it. Um, One of the things that, that happened because of this approach of responsiveness was that very quickly the foundation found itself getting into areas of areas, projects, kinds of projects that normally people didn't think of at least 30 years ago as necessarily related to development. Uh, the example that uh, always sticks in my mind, the examples uh, were um, various projects for cultural uh, revitalization, cultural preservation, uh, indigenous groups, ethnic groups uh, from all over the hemisphere were sending us proposals about different things they wanted to do to preserve their language, which they felt was in danger of disappearing, this is the ethnic groups, indigenous groups, uh, to preserve uh, dance, music, songs, stories, folklore, uh, weavings, all kinds of aspects of their culture. And because we were uh, we re were responsive, and because we could make our own decisions about what we would fund, we started funding projects like that. And in the course of uh, experience with those projects, started to see that development was a much more complex pro process than uh, I think most people thought of uh, at that time. We started to see all the psychological implications of cultural change, of cultures feeling themselves under pressure. We started seeing how important a, sense, a personal sense of identity was, a, a sense of identity based on a sense of being a part of a culture, how much that would help people uh, give them the self-confidence to confront their problems, to really have the, um, 
the independence and the, the assuredness about themselves and their communities to, to take steps to deal with their own problems. So, a couple of examples, I think, and, and, and another thing that I think is important about the Foundation, and one of the things I always try to emphasize, is that we've been doing this for a long period of time. We've been doing it for over 30 years. We've funded something over 4,500 individual projects. Um, if you look at each individual pro project, it generally is going to be pretty small and perhaps not that impressive. The average project we fund uh, is usually for three years and uh, usually with a dollar amount of about $250,000, $300,000. So the, the average is about eighty or $90,000 a year that's going to a project over a three-year period. There are several, many cases where we've <coughs> continued to fund projects after the after that initial three years. In some cases, we've been involved with groups for 12 or more years. Uh, those are the exceptions, I guess, rather than the rule. But when you keep doing it, when you keep funding in an area, when you keep funding a certain kind of, of um, activity that's, uh, that's driven by poor people, uh, there's a kind of a cumulative effect. I think that particularly in the Andes, you, you can see this really all over the place, but, but some of the best examples we have are in the Andes with the indigenous movements. We, we have a long record of consistently funding projects in Ecuador and um, uh, Bolivia and Peru. And in, I would say particularly in Bolivia and Ecuador, the emergence of the indigenous movement as, as really a social force and, and, uh, and as political actors is something that is very dramatic in the last 30 years. And I, it, it's not because we were funding it, but it, it's a, a process that I think the kind of funding we were doing, doing was aiding that process. Uh, we funded organizations that were trying to organize at a community level and then a regional level and a state level and eventually at the national level. And in Bolivia, for example, you see a whole uh, process of revitalization and, and, and valuing uh, traditional Indian knowledge about agriculture, about weavings, um, about education, about training, about uh, their own forms of democratic organization, all of which I think we played some small role in uh, supporting as people were trying to either preserve or to expand those, those kinds of, of cultural practices. And now I think you can see the impact of that at, at a national level as the indigenous movements really become for the first time really in 400, well, over 400 years, uh, very important political, social actors in, in their countries. Um, looking back over those 4,000 plus projects and particularly comparing it with um, what goes on in most of the efforts for economic and social development, I think it's fair to say that, uh, that our record is quite good. There's very few projects that really fail in the sense of crash and burn. Uh, many projects don't necessarily reach the goals that they set out at the beginning, but in general, uh, most of the projects we funded, I think, have in one way or another led to strengthened community organizations. Uh, because we're in contact with the groups, we've been able to see patterns over the years where uh, a project will not necessarily reach the goal that it set out for itself, but there's enough experience in problem solving that the organization itself is strengthened and instead of giving up, tries again and goes on. And we, there are many records, many examples of uh, community groups that have failed three or four times and finally hit it. I mean, we, have, we have success stories, and the success stories are built on a record of previous failures, but the people never, never quit trying. So in that sense, I think um, I, would, I would call the, the, the project successes. We, we issue a, a public statement about each project, and this is a statement that goes to the Congress to let them know what we're doing. It goes to the embassies to let them know what we're doing. And I've, I've always thought it was significant that the public statement basically has two long paragraphs. The first one is about the group, and it basically tells the history of the group and why we're funding it, and the second is about the project. And I think the fact that traditionally we've always put the group first uh, is, is revealing about the, what we're really looking for. I mean. Most development projects, um, the importance of them is really not the, the specific problem that people are trying to overcome as much as it is their experience in overcoming that, that problem and the, uh, the sense of community that they take from that experience and then can carry on to something else. So that's basically what we, we look for. 
Um, this whole uh, this whole record, I think, rests on uh, what really has been a very significant change in Latin America in the last 30 or 40 years, and I referred to the indigenous movements in the Andes. <laughs> but you really see this throughout the throughout the hemisphere, throughout Latin America and the Caribbean. I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Colombia in the early 1960s. My job, the job of most of my colleagues, was to work with community organizations to try to convince people that organizing themselves was the best way to go about solving their problems. Twenty years later, it would be absurd to send a Peace Corps volunteer to tell people how to organize. Latin America is full at the grassroots level of organizations. I mean, every community you go to is kind of an alphabet soup of different uh, local organizations, environmental organizations, human rights organizations. The idea of organizing um, has caught on in a, in a major way in Latin America, and I think it, it's one of the more important phenomena over the last half century. And it's precisely one, one of the things that's always uh, interested me about it is it's precisely the kind of behavior at the local level that the Tocqueville was so impressed with in the United States in the 1830s when he traveled around and saw in the habit of local organization uh, the, the bedrock of American democracy. And I think that there's a, in many ways a similar process going on in Latin America. And again, it's not something we take credit for. It's not something we did. But I think it's been... Um, a, an incredible learning experience for, for us and a point of pride for us that it's something that we've been able to accompany over these, these last 30 years. So in that period of time, we've spent uh, just about a half billion dollars of your money, your, of taxpayers' money. Um, and since we always ask for counterpart in projects, uh, that means, and, and because the counterpart generally uh, outweighs the money we put in, that means well over a billion dollars has gone into um, grassroots projects, those 4,500 grass, grassroots projects. Um, but that's over 30 years. That's a very small amount of money over 30 years if you compare it to what goes on uh, in the World Bank, IDB, the Inter-American Development Bank, AID, and European donors, and so on. Uh, currently, our budget, our entire budget, including support costs, uh, just the overhead costs, is <laughs> less than one-tenth of one percent of what the U.S. government spends every year on its foreign operations budget, which uh, the foreign uh, operations appropriations, which covers all, almost all of our foreign assistance programs. So w less than one-tenth of one percent goes into the, this kind of work in Latin America. There's a similar organization called the African Development Foundation, which is modeled on us, that does similar work in Africa with basically the same kind of budget. Um, so with that amount of money, I once calculated how much we cost the average taxpayer. And uh, so I used to call the Inter-American Foundation a two-bit agency because we were it was costing about 25 cents from each individual taxpayer. Now with um, uh, the overall growth of the federal budget, uh, our percentage is much less. So we're just about a, we're not quite a nickel and dime agency, but we're about a dime agency. So. Okay. Over that same period of time, the U.S. Uh, taxpayers have put uh, untold billions into all other kinds of forms of foreign assistance, most of which gets channeled through governments. Um, there's been a lot of um, analysis of what's happened with that, most of it bad. Uh, we've seen in the last 30, 40 years one development fad replacing another. Each one is the magic bullet that's going to, going to solve the problems of poverty, they never do. Agencies get reorganized. The World Bank and AID, for example, have been reorganized at least seven or eight times each since the 1960s. Um, you see newspaper reports uh, steadily of uh, waste, embezzlement, uh, corruption, uh, projects that lead to environmental disasters, and so on. A lot of money has gone into the development effort with, with very good intentions, and it's been strongly supported by U.S. taxpayers. Um, I, you probably are aware of <coughs> studies, public opinion studies, in which people think that we spend too much money on foreign assistance and too much of it goes into Swiss bank accounts or down rat holes. But, mo but in those surveys, what's also come out is that most people 
are not aware of how little we actually spend on foreign assistance, and most people would be willing to spend a lot more taxpayer money on foreign assistance. Or at least they, they, they think the percentage of the budget that should be spent on foreign assistance is higher than it, much higher than it actually is. Um, so given the fact that, I think it's a fact that, that a grassroots development approach that responds to what people really want to do for themselves, that that kind of approach I think has been demonstrated pretty conclusively that it works. And given the fact that a lot of what we spent great sums of money on, uh, in many cases, clearly has not worked, my question, and I come back to the question, why don't we do more of the former and less of the latter? And I just want to, um, in a few minutes remaining, I want to just uh, put out a couple of uh, ideas about that, and, and perhaps that could be the basis of uh, a, a conversation, because I'd like to stop talking pretty soon and... and invite you to join me in this. Um, so I think that there are, se there are several answers as to why we keep doing the things we do. And, you know, it's as simple as just inertia, uh, there's bureaucratic self-interest, there are a lot of major organizations that are already doing this and would prefer to keep doing it. Uh, there's, uh, there's an entire industry that's grown up around development, uh, not just the people who work for the agencies, but the, the all the consultant firms that populate the Washington Beltway area. Um, there's the uh, national government's interest in having development assistance as a political tool. It's, it's always been used uh, as a political tool, and it's, it's part of the bag of tools that the State Department and the administration generally, any State Department, any administration likes to have. But I just want to comment uh, briefly on what I think is, is more of an underlying reason for why we keep doing what we do. And I think that's basically that it, when we look at poverty, we don't really trust people to solve their own problems because that's the root of this grassroots approach, the, the idea that you can trust people to come up with their own solutions. And, and even below that, I think we, we just t tend to think in the same terms all the time. We do very little thinking outside the, the box in, in, in talking about development. There's, a, there's an article which, if you're interested uh, and have spent time reading about development, that I'm sure many of you have seen by William Easterly, which is called The Cartel of Good Intentions. It's a 70-page article, which is one of the most scathing, searing critiques of the development business uh, that I've read, really. I mean, he really goes after the AID and the World Bank and the other agencies in, in a very um, uh, harsh way. And he starts off that article by <coughs> picturing a poor person in Ethiopia, in rural Ethiopia, who wants to get a pothole in front of his house fixed. And he then takes that problem of the pothole in front of this house in rural Ethiopia through the Byzantine world of development agencies and the reports and the evaluations and all the things that have to be done and literally traces uh, scores and scores of steps that would have to be accomplished for some aid to finally get to that person in front of his house in Ethiopia. And nowhere in the entire article does Easterly ever even contemplate the idea that that guy and his neighbors could do it themselves, that they could get together, find a shovel, use a piece of cardboard, push dirt around, but one way or another it could be done. And that the experience of doing it themselves and the experience of organizing themselves to doing it themselves would then probably take them on to being able to solve other problems. And, and this idea, I think, just generally does not enter into the, the development framework uh, as most people think about it, even people who are very critical of it. And as a result of that and some other things, I've, and just some reading over the last few years, I've been, I've been trying to do some thinking about the way we all think about development. And that led me into uh, some reading that kind of seems far afield from the development world. Uh, I started reading a lot about uh, science, the history of science, and it seems to me that a lot of the way we think about development is really a very kind of linear, mechanistic approach that really can be traced all the way back to Newton. Newton's discoveries in the 17th century about gravitation, and Newton's calculus, the whole, uh, his physics, the uh, whole study of the of the planets, their movements, which, you know, was probably the great scientific breakthrough uh, 
for human beings. I mean, that Newton's insights revolutionized the world and really made science, I think, uh, the kind of mental framework for really understanding everything else. The, the accomplishments based on what Newton discovered were so incredible that the assumptions and the paradigm really became applied to everything else. And I think ever since then, we have continued to think in the sort of uh, framework that, that really came out of, of, of Newton's discoveries. And it tends to be linear, it tends to be mechanistic, it tends to assume, assume that systems like the solar system are more or less stable. And there are a lot of assumptions to that. It, it, there's a cause and effect input-output assumption. You put in something, you get something out. You put in capital, you get development. The, the idea that, that systems are stable means that you put in a little input, you get a little output. You put in a big input, you get a bigger output. That's basically the thinking behind calls over the years for putting much more resource, <coughs> resources into foreign assistance. I mean, it seems to me that given the, the history of failures, it's not really a lack of, of resources going into it. It's what's done with the resources. But the general argument in development work is that you need to put much more money into it. And, and it's that assumption. Put a lot more in, you'll get a lot more out. Recently, in the last two, three decades, there's been a lot of uh, work, a lot of popular literature written. I'm not a scientist. I have no background, really, in science. But uh, I find some of this compelling. There's been a lot of uh, work on studies of chaos and complexity. And what I find interesting in it is the metaphors that come out of those studies. Um, Chaos is basically how do you study something as inherently chaotic, unstable as a weather system. And I'm sure you've all, there's even a movie coming out now I've seen. I'm sure you've all read about the butterfly effect. The, you know, butterfly flaps wings in the Amazon and you get a snowstorm in Chicago as that little input starts cascading through the system. Um, complex systems... Uh, scientists started looking at the human immune system, at the behavior of genes, uh, at birds, uh, a flock of birds flying through the sky and how they maneuver to avoid predators or obstacles. All these kind of complex systems, which uh, many of which can be modeled on computers, and the computer has really been the handmaiden to, to the study of a lot of, the, of these scientific uh, questions. Um, all of that in, in the study of complexity led to conclusions about how um, self-organization goes on, how systems have the innate capacity, systems like that have the innate capacity to, to, uh, to learn, to adapt. Uh, the immune system in the body is an adaptive system. It, just, it doesn't do the same thing all the time in a mechanistic way. It adapts to, to new conditions. And people started seeing these patterns in chaotic systems, in com complex systems. And, and coming up with these descriptions, which I think in many ways provide more useful metaphors for us when we try to understand what goes on in a, a social system that is a small, poor rural community in Latin America, for example. So that um, I'm, I'm playing around with this idea. I'm trying to write an article for the, the next issue of, of our journal, which talks about the role of metaphors in the development discourse, how we talk about development, and suggesting that perhaps there are more useful metaphors to find in these new sciences than in the more classical science that, from which we traditionally have drawn our metaphors. And I think if we, if, as those metaphors make their way into our consciousness, I think they will help us think in more, in, uh, more creative ways about development issues. Um, if we could begin seeing in hum human, capacity, uh, human communities the same capacity for uh, adaptive behavior, uh, it, I think, would encourage us to rely more on the capacity of poor people to understand their own problems and come up with their own solutions. Uh, it would help us to drop the illusion of control that is in all development projects. Uh, development projects are typically designed by experts. Everything is put together in a, in a project paper, and very specific outcomes are, are expected. But all the studies of chaos and complexity suggest that the the power that's inherent in that kind of control has to be seeded and dispersed downwards to permit adaptive behavior, to permit, permit systems to, uh, to emerge and to, uh, to adapt. Um, we'd also, I think, to some extent, give up the idea of predictability. 
because we insist that development projects have predictable uh, outcomes, we force um, complex processes into very simplistic uh, frameworks. This is something that even on our level we, we deal with all the time. We will fund a project and a year later the group will come back that had intended to raise cattle, they'll come back and say the market is just not there, we can't do it, we want to use the funds to change to uh, to raising chickens, something like that. The um, And I think one of, one of the good things about the foundation is that generally we've been flexible enough to go along with grantees who are coming up with, who are adapting, who are adapting to their conditions and coming up with, with new ideas. Uh, many development projects don't really contemplate that. The project paper says, you know, raise cattle and that's what you should raise. So um, I think all the, this, this idea of, of different kinds of metaphors, metaphors that emphasize creativity, uh, adaptability, flexibility, I, I think will eventually help us understand the, um, uh, the, what really is going on at the grassroots level in, in development projects. And, um, and, and one other uh, outcome, I think, would be, as we start to understand this better, I think we'll shift away from the major uh, billion-dollar development projects that, w that we've seen so much over the last 30, 40 years into many more numerous smaller projects. And the implication of that would be that development workers, rather than um, spending all their time in front of a computer screen designing projects, would be actually spending more time out in the field interacting with people and, and really in a more, much more personal level understanding what's going on on the ground as people face development challenges. And that kind of contact, which is something I learned in rural Honduras many years ago traveling around with Jan, would turn the development process, among other things, into something that would just be much more fun to do. So let me stop there and um, invite comments, questions. I understand I'm supposed to repeat the questions for purposes of recording. Uh, the question was, uh, how did the Inter-American Foundation first uh, make the decision to fund, uh, to, to respond to these proposals that were coming in about cultural revitalization? Uh, I wasn't there at the time. Uh, my sense is that uh, we had several uh, people with an anthropology background on the staff, several of the, the foundation reps, who I think probably just intuitively responded to it. But most of the people who worked at the foundation, and in fact, many of the people who were uh, on the original board of directors, were people who, who already had a lot of experience on the ground. Um, there were a lot of Peace Corps volunteers, a lot of people with a missionary background. Uh, a couple of the board members who played a very important role were retail businessmen for companies like uh, Sears Roebuck and Quaker Oats, which, which basically had to understand their customers to sell their goods in Latin America. So. I think the foundation was very uh, fortunate in the kind of people who were attracted to it right at the beginning. Uh, I think there was a great wealth of understanding of what the grassroots looked like in Latin America, and, and I think that's probably what made them a little bit more open to something like that. question is how do uh, grassroots groups know about us and how do they know that they can get aid from an organization like ours? Uh, the first few years of the foundation, that was the, the big challenge, was to uh, make people aware of the foundation. So I think in the first few years, the reps spent a lot of time just traveling and talking to people, uh, handing out information, letting people know that something like the foundation existed. This was in the early 1970s. Um, it also, uh, another challenge for the reps at that point was to uh, gradually convince people that it was not a CIA front uh, because that was uh, suspicion. Um, and a lot of groups in Latin America, I, I, I first got involved with the foundation by writing some articles and then later I wrote a book uh, commissioned by the foundation. And so in the process of doing that, I interviewed hundreds of people around Latin America. And many people told me that when they first heard about the foundation, they were very suspicious about where this was coming from and what kind of information these people were looking for. And over a period of two or three years, 
uh, they basically decided it was okay. They had seen enough of the reps in the, in their countries to uh, think that they could trust them. Um, so that's how we that's how it started. Um, I would think after the first ten years or so, the foundation was quite well known in Latin America. I, I've been complaining about how small uh, an agency it is from the viewpoint of Washington or from the U.S. government. But actually, in Latin America, the foundation is a fairly big actor. Uh, if you look at who's funding grassroots development, there are not that many groups doing it. Oxfam, some of the church groups and so on, uh, some of the German, uh, European groups in general. But the foundation is very much uh, a player at the grassroots level in Latin America, so people know about it. And then recently, the other um, uh, the other way is the Internet. Uh, we have a web page. It's in all Creole, and Haitian Creole, Portuguese, Spanish, and English, of course. And um, the Internet is fairly widespread in Latin America. There are very few places that you can go to that don't have at least an Internet cafe, and most organizations of any size uh, have, have computers. So access to the Internet has, has uh, expanded rapidly. So that's the other way that people know about it. Does the African Development Foundation, which is uh, a kind of a counterpart to us, have as much success? Uh, I wish I could answer that concretely. It's it's a very strange thing. We are sort of sister organizations with very little. We're like sisters who don't talk to one another. I've got daughters. Uh, the um, Because we work in such different areas of the world, uh, we really don't spend that much time talking to one another. We're all kind of regional specialists. So that there's usually some kind of contact at, at the presidential level. Uh, we occasionally have meetings, but I can't really answer it specifically because I don't have real information about what goes on on the ground. Go ahead. Did you have? Yes. Have the grassroots groups in Latin America uh, changed in direction or intensity? Um, the grassroots groups, it's a long story. I mean, I think that, that the, the history of the appearance of so many grassroots groups really goes back to probably at least the 50s. I think it was uh, largely church-related. Uh, the Catholic Church in the 50s uh, began encouraging the organization of groups in poor neighborhoods. Protestant churches came in uh, doing similar things around that time. Um, so I think that was one of the major influences that, that got the process going and, and, and really helped it because it had sort of the approval, the approval of the churches. Along with that went uh, another thing which was very important. So many people that I've interviewed over the, <coughs> excuse me, over the years who have worked, who work as promoters, who work as uh, technicians and, and organizers, um, are people who got their start in projects uh, that were, well, they, they got their start in schools when, uh, in most cases, priests would take them out to a poor neighborhood on the weekend to work, to do something in a poor neighborhood. Uh, so many of the people, if I asked them, where, where did you come from? Where did, how did you get interested in this? Uh, if you push it back far enough, it's usually that kind of experience as a young person, usually from, say, a middle-class background confronting poverty, you know, a mile away from their house in a, in, a, in a very poor neighborhood. So I think that's what really got the process going. Um, the Cuban Revolution played a role in some ways, I think. I mean, I've had people tell me this, that the, the success of the Cuban Revolution in overthrowing a dictator uh, gave young people in Latin America the idea that we can change the system, you know. I mean, not everybody went in the same direction as the Cuban Revolution did. But that idea that change is possible is, is I think, one impact that, that the revolution had in Latin America. Um, the, the movement has gone through, I mean, it, it, I don't even think it's fair to call it a movement because it's so, it's so varied, but it's gone through so many different uh, stages that I'm, I'm not re even really sure there's a pattern. Uh, in some, in some cases, it became political very quickly. In some cases, it moved into radical political uh, action, and um, which you know ended in violence or imprisonment or all kinds of things. Uh, 
in many cases it stayed very locally focused and, and focused very much on agricultural production or something like that. Um, in other countries, you had linkages. I think particularly among the uh, indigenous groups, this idea of uh, communities linking and, and kind of re-energizing traditional linkages started to, to play a role. So it, it's changed dramatically. It's, about, it's an adaptive system. It, it's, it's adapting to its uh, um, circumstances. Um, during the Pinochet dictatorship in Chile, uh, there was a very vibrant um, grassroots group uh, movement going on, despite official hostility. Um, curiously, when the when Pinochet left, when a democratic government took over, many of those people uh, went right back into the government, even though they had been talking for several years about how important it was to have this sort of citizen activity outside the government. Chile is, I think, a country with such a strong tradition of, of strong government uh, and, and a, a principal role for the government that, that many of those people went right back into the government. In other places, uh, similar things have happened, but people continue with their own organizations. So it's, 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 it's a fascinating, but I think extremely complex phenomenon. Uh, human development seems to be the, the current fad in development circles, and uh, it covers things like education and health, among others, and uh, isn't, there, uh, isn't that uh, an area in which the government should play uh, uh, a central role, an important role? Is, is that a fair summary? Okay. Um, uh, I think, I mean, all the fads that have come along have been good ideas. It's just that we do them for a while and we get tired of them and go on to something else. Um, the in this whole area, I mean, I'm I'm quite skeptical about the government role in development in general, uh, in any any government's role. I mean, I think that the function of the government is basically to provide an it, sort of enabling environment for it to take place, as opposed to being able to do it themselves, because so many other things enter into it. But I think it's precisely in uh, like health, uh, at least. In, in terms of uh, preventative health that the government can play, government programs obviously play a very important role, just vaccination programs. Vaccination programs, for example, is a perfect, uh, you know, simple linear relationship. If you vaccinate people, they won't get sick. And that's the kind of thing that uh, with, you know, the resources and, and the, the will to do it, governments can do very effectively. So I, it's not that I think that grassroots development, uh, grassroots organization is the answer to every development problem, certainly. Um, one of the things that we're finding in Latin America, and this is, um, I think, particularly in the last few years, that one of the most, most interesting things is that because the grassroots groups have reached such a level of organization, they are more effectively interacting now with government organizations. So we get a whole phenomenon. Most of the projects we fund now involve grassroots groups with the cooperation of local governments and frequently the local business sector. And, uh, I would say probably a majority of the groups we fund at this point have uh, organized themselves and have got it, gotten a seat at the table to the point which they can now uh, use those resources, which 20 years ago were just in a different world for them. So there's, there's more of an interrelationship, I think, between grassroots development and you know, government efforts now. Mm -hmm. The, part, the question is about counterpart, counterpart that we go. Okay. If so, if they are required to come up with some funds of their own, how does it, where do they get those funds and how does that affect the grassroots nature of that project? Mm -hmm. The question is about the counterpart funds that we require uh, from all grantees that we make grants to and where do they 
uh, where do they get those funds? Uh, counterparty is not just funds. It's, um, it's uh, office space. It's labor. It's whatever kind of resource. It's a truck. If the group has a truck already, we, we count. I mean, and we, we work with groups to, you know, what are you putting into the project? You're putting in your time. You're putting in your truck. You're putting in gasoline. We try to put a value on every one of those items. And in many cases, things that they had not really thought that they were contributing. And we enter that. So we, we do a, a budget that shows what we're doing and what they're doing. And we think that's really important because it's another way that the project belongs to them. You know, it's not just a gift from the outside, but this is a cooperation between them and us. And the idea is we're, we're partners in it. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much. The time's out.